Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, help us this day to understand and celebrate your dream for the world, to be transformed in Jesus' love, and to use our gifts to make a difference for others. Amen. Happy Laetare Sunday, the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. Kind of almost like a date in Advent, a bit halfway through the season, so as to give you some energy and some encouragement and some joy, despite all the suffering. Be joyful, even those of you who are mourning. Be joyful, even those of you who have yet to get the vaccine. Be joyful, those of you who are still holding on to the pain of what the last year has been in isolation from one another, from our routines, and from the ones we love. Rejoice, because it is through this suffering that eternal life, life bigger than you even have imagined, will be available for you. Unfortunately, there's a caveat, if you believe. Right? So we're going to spend a little time today just kind of exploring the two lessons assigned for today. Uh, let's take a look. Hmm. John 3.16 in our Gospel today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You see it everywhere, baseball games in particular. Right on the other side of home plate, a little sign. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He continues to say, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. That death is not the end of us, as proven by Jesus' resurrection. But let me go back. So this gospel references the first lesson. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that's kind of a big deal, that event, so I'll get to that in a second. So must the Son of God be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So bronze serpent being lifted up in our first lesson in Numbers. And Jesus, too, must be lifted up in our second lesson from the Gospel of John. How are those related? I like to think that the image of God in both of those is pretty complicated. So we're going to just dive right in. So with Moses... Everyone was walking, walking to freedom. From enslavement to freedom. That was the journey. They didn't like the food. They didn't like the people they were walking with, maybe. They didn't like so many things of this new journey. But they held on to hope that they were going to get to some new place for some miraculous new life until they couldn't hold on to that any longer and they complained too much. So there's this passage where they were complaining, and it says, the Lord sent. So I don't know if that's true or not, or the sentiment, or everyone blamed God for it. But apparently, the Lord then sent poisonous snakes. These poisonous snakes then bit them, and people died when they complained. And then they complained to Moses, and they asked Moses to pray for them and to relent and just say, hey, God, do something about this. So Moses did. He went to God, said something about it on behalf of the people. God relented and actually intervened in another way and said, all right, Moses, this is what you do. You create a snake and you hold it up high and anyone who looks at that snake will then live. Even if they were bitten, they'll live. So Moses goes and does this. He makes this bronze snake. People get bitten by a poisonous snake. He holds up the stick. And they look at the snake. And they're given eternal life. 
or they don't die. Sometimes those are the same, sometimes they're different. So then you get to the gospel and we're comparing or we're making this parallel that Moses lifting up this bronze cross had saved so many people because when their eyes lifted up, they were granted life. When they were looking at the cause of their suffering, they were given life. I don't know why so many theologians, so many people ask that question. Why must there be suffering? Why did Jesus have to die on a cross to gain eternal life for everyone? Why, why, why? I suppose that's a lifetime of investigating and wonder for us. But to say that Jesus will be like Moses or that Jesus will be lifted on a cross like that bronze snake so that when we look to Jesus and Jesus' suffering, we too are given life. The last few weeks in Lent, in our observance of Lent, we have introduced a practice to you called the examine. Come from uh, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. He named, he listed and named so many different prayer practices that the spiritual exercises now has been a book over 500 years and people use it for their own retreats in, personally and in a group. So we took one of those prayers, the examine, and we shared it with you and we said, hey, take a look at these. If it's helpful this season, pray with it. Another prayer um, meditation that Ignatius offers us in the spiritual exercises is a fun one that I'd like to introduce to you today in addition to the examine. So he has this moment where he literally just imagines and invites the retreatant to imagine. What was it like for the Trinity to take a look at the world and say, hmm, maybe we should do something about that. Maybe we should intervene and send Jesus. Like, what would that moment have been like? And when I close my eyes and I jump into that imaginative prayer, I'm just smiling at how fun the Trinity is, first of all. The inner relationship of a parent, a sibling, the glue that kind of puts them together, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but also the creator, the redeemer, the sanctifier, all those, all those pieces built as community. And when they looked at the world and saw all the suffering, felt with so much compassion and mercy, wanted to do something about it. And so sent Jesus, the most human form of this community, to interrupt our lives, to be with us. Hmm. Makes me think of those bracelets, what would Jesus do? Which is really catchy. And for the most part, really practical <laughs> in the ways that we ought to behave if we want to align ourselves to the way of God, the way of love, the way of Jesus. And I also think that just like we know in the Gospel of John, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. What would Jesus do gets to some of it. Like Jesus would do these things because we know that in the story. And Jesus is also the way. Jesus is our through way. So we look at passages of him being present with lepers, people who have been outcast, set aside, set outside of community. To suffer in their pain alone so as not to influence, damage, poison the center of society. So Jesus went there 
So if you want to know what Jesus would have done, he would go to the margins. So that's one way. And he would do these things, so we too must do that. We must go to the margins. We must include those who have been excluded. We must listen to people's suffering and be there. And that, my friends, is a great life in the life of Jesus and Jesus' love. And I also think because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that Jesus is the vessel for which we go and see and be with one another. So if Jesus goes to the margins and goes to the lepers, yeah, we're supposed to do that too. And if we use Jesus as a vessel for which if we see Jesus' life as the way the Trinity hoped to intervene in our life as an example and as a through way to one another, we see him relating and he becomes transparent because he's really trying to connect my heart and your heart, my body and your body, my suffering and your suffering, my empathy to your empathy. And there, in fact, we have become the ones we've been waiting for, not to make it all about us, But Alice Walker says this, Barack Obama says this, they say they quote June Jordan, you know, and maybe Sweet Honey and the Rock quoted her too, or maybe it was Lisa Sullivan, all these different people around post-civil rights time. I think it's kind of fun that we don't really know who initially said it because I feel like it's a communal sentiment. So in this communal sentiment, Jesus reminds us because he is the way that we are what we've been waiting for. So yeah, he had 12 followers, or 11, or centuries old of people who have followed his way and what he has done. And I think for me, possibly for you today, has Jesus reintroduced you to one another? in a way that feels as though we're invited to enter into the suffering just as God through the Trinity sent Jesus, that we too are sent to bring joy and glad tidings, particularly where there is suffering. So in just a couple minutes, I'd invite you to... um, Find a comfortable place as we take a look at this examine. And um, the best part, I think, of the examine, if you, if you haven't noticed, the questions are the same every time you do it. But what is unique to the way Ignatius introduces this activity for us is that we have to name a desire. And that desire ideally is aligned to God's desire. And so the desire that we, that we held out for all of us this week is we pray for the desire to resist turning away from the suffering of others. What we didn't write in that is because we think that will save us, because we think that because Jesus, when we look at Jesus on the cross, just like that bronze serpent, and they were saved, we will look at Jesus on the cross and go, Wow, he has overcome death, and because of that, we too are saved. We pray for the desire to resist turning away from the suffering of others. So just chew on that desire for a moment. If you need to pause this part to slow yourself down, please do what you need to do. If you need to speed it up, please do what you need to do. And now we just go through the five steps of the examine. I find it helpful to rotate my shoulders sometimes to create more room in my heart and my soul 
for how God will come and interrupt my daily life and make more space for God's goodness and God's mercy and God's compassion. And I pray that we do that together as an entire St. Paul's community and our neighbors to do the same thing. So with open hands and rotated shoulders, let us first consider what we are to be thankful for. In this particular sense, you may want to consider the suffering that you have endured or the suffering that people in your family have endured or the suffering in our community that we've endured and actually maybe even practice offering a thanksgiving for the suffering. Secondly, we invite the Spirit. We invite the Spirit to come and breathe life in us, to give us encouragement and strength to be able to look at suffering in a deeper way, in a truer way, in a longer way, because this is hard. Perhaps some of our memories were constructed in a particular way, and now we invite the Spirit to break through previous ways of knowing to reassemble some of those memories for us because we know that Jesus is the way and we know that Jesus has overcome death. And so we take a moment now to find God in all of this. We might have found ourselves asking why, 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 why me or why suffering, but look for God. Look for the God who, unlike the first lesson, who caused more suffering, but look for the God who actually intervened, like the Trinity, into our lives to bring joy and connection, even amidst the mourning. So look for that God. You may or may not have found God, and God may or may not have found you. So you may want to spend a little more time <laughs> with that. And when you're ready, move to asking for right relationship, or some people would say asking for forgiveness. Was there something that I or we could have done a little differently? Did I just brush aside that person's suffering because I was impatient, or I've heard it all before, or I've got my own stuff. Ask for forgiveness there. Because we were given many opportunities to connect with one another, and we might not have been ideal in every situation. So it doesn't have to be heavy. It just has to be noticed. And lastly, we move ahead in hopefulness, in real deep-seated hopefulness that yes, someday our experience of one another will be fuller and richer because of our faith. Well, maybe tomorrow I'll be a little more patient or I'll stand up for myself so that <laughs> I'm not just listening to somebody the entire time, but I too can share with someone, or in our community, what is the hopefulness we want to hold together in the midst of the very active, active desires and calls now we find ourselves in in 2021. So my friends, there has been great suffering, and our desire this week is not to turn away from suffering and not to turn away from other suffering, but to look it right in the eye, just like that bronze serpent, just like Jesus on the cross, 
We look to our neighbor's suffering, we look to our own suffering, so that we too may be gifted eternal life, life in its fullness.